What I want you to do is say, I ain't got no money for you, okay? Because I don't really want to be in a conversation with him anyway. I'm not trying to make him angry. I just want him to leave me alone. So the body language, the words I use, send a very strong message, and they have to be congruent, okay? Words, body language, and tonality often send the same message. If I say, leave me alone, <laughs> right? He's going to go, oh, yeah, sure, right? So the body language, the tonality often send the same. Body language is the most critical component, 55%, right? Face-to-face -face communication, 55% body language. Tonality is next. I've got to send a strong message. The words are least important, but they are important because Mark Twain said it better than anybody could say it. The difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning bug and lightning, right? If I tell you I live in a house or a mansion, do you get a different picture? They're both houses, aren't they? So the words are important, so we need to make sure they're the right words. But they're short and to the point. I don't have any money for you, I'm sorry. All right? Leave me alone. All right? Have a seat. Thank you very much. No I mean, problem. scare you. If I walk up to her and I say, hey, looks like you need some help. Let me get your groceries. You're going to drop your groceries, okay? And she looks at me and says, I didn't ask for your help, and I don't need it. Is that pretty definitive? Yes. That shuts me down pretty quickly, doesn't it? Right? If I'm a good guy and I really wanted to help her, I'm going to walk away. I might mutter a few adjectives, right? <laughs> Fine, right? If I'm a bad guy, I'm not going to stop. Here are the techniques that they use. The first one is what's called forced teaming. I'm going to walk up and I'm going to do something, one of these techniques. And I'm going to ha offer her assistance, or I'm going to ask for quarters, or I'm going to do whatever. And when she says, I ain't got any change for her, I'm sorry, and she keeps walking, I'm going to go, OK, that's OK, I'll walk with you. That's called force teaming. I'm making you partner with me. You need to spot that for what it is. That's dangerous, all right? The other one is called an unsolicited promise. If I say, don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you, that should ring a really big bell for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, because if I'm genuinely a nice person, I'm not even thinking about hurting you. I got to think about it before I said it, and you should go, oh, that's bad. All right? Another one is called charm. Okay? Are there people who are charismatic and charming automatically, naturally? That's who they are? Yeah, there are. So this is the intuitive part of us using our brains to kick in and go, I don't trust this person. But understand this about charm. It always wants something. So the question is this, what do you want from me? Why are you being so charming and nice? My daughter is a beautiful and charming girl, okay? Model and actress. But when she is extra charming to me, <laughs> money is coming out of my pocket and ain't nothing I can do to defend myself, right? And she knows it. So I am just a total victim. Charm wants something. When somebody walks up to you you don't even know, and they're being extra charming, extra insouciant, extra charismatic, you got to go, what do you want? That's what should be going through your mind. The other one is ignoring the word no. She said no to me, and I did not pay any attention to that. That's called conspicuous ignoring. She said, leave me alone. And I said, oh, no, no, you need my help. So I grab a bag from her, and then I use the next technique, which is force teaming. You've got to spot that for what it is. When they use these skills on you, they basically have interviewed you, decided you're a good victim, and now they're forcing you to work with them in some way. Force teaming, charm, ignoring the word no, conspicuous ignoring, all of those things I've just shared with you are the things I see <clears throat> that run through a lot of crime reports. So pay attention to those. The second you get that intuitive flash that says, this doesn't seem right, it ain't right, immediately start to do something that's safe for you, okay? because they will use these techniques. It can get this artistic, it can get this drawn out. The last technique is what's called too much detail. Anybody who has children knows what I'm talking about. How'd you rip your pants? And there's a 10 minute story with that, okay? They're lying to you. Because they know the story doesn't make any sense, so the more detail they add, the more plausible it's supposed to sound. Bad guys do it too. The most popular one is this, man, the Dayton police are getting ready to tow my car off the freeway and my family's in the car and I need $50 for the tow. And you know what? I work at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and I work in the Special Investigations Division and I can access my ATM account with your card. <laughs> now, okay, all right. How ridiculous does that sound sitting here in this room? He does it every day and it works. 
People will walk over to the ATM with him, insert their card, put in their PIN number, he pushes them aside, withdraws two or three hundred dollars from their account. Three or four hours later, they call us and go, I think that money came out of my account. You think? Sure it did. He can tell a story that ridiculous, that ludicrous, but because he is so good at it, he's done it so many times, he's so charming and charismatic, he sucks you into his world. Okay? And you buy it. And is there a little subtle amount of intimidation probably going on there too? Sure there is. Okay, it's borderline robbery, but it's not quite. And many times, they have broken no law. We might try a theft by deception, but I'm not sure that's going to go anywhere. You gave him the money. You gave him access to the account. You did it. So a lot of times we're going to say, yeah, I can even tell you who did it. I can tell you the guy's name, okay? But you gave it to him. So in the terms of this, think in. These are the predator tactics they are using against you. Spot them for what they are, okay? and immediately make a plan to do something different. Now I want to move into the specific part of workplace violence training for you guys. If you have an active shooter in the building, these are some of the principles that I want you to talk, that, that I want you to, to work with. Understand that several months ago, John Merwin and myself came to your building and did what we call a crime prevention through environmental design study. What we found were a couple things. Number one, in several cases, you were deliberately disengaging the electronic security systems for your access doors. We literally walk through your building from the back entrance, which was left unlocked and is left unlocked all the time, and got all the way to the media rooms. Is that what they're called? To the station, to where they actually shoot television shows without using a badge. So we walk through your environment, and nobody challenged us. I was not in uniform. And we got through there with not one access tool. We just walked around in here until we got to where we wanted to go. That cannot happen. Those doors are designed for a reason, and you cannot defeat them. So if they're locked, leave them locked. You should have to have a pass to get in. It is your job for security, not just Carlos's. Security is everybody's responsibility, not just the security people's. So when you're coming into this building, you see somebody in the parking lot that doesn't, you've never seen before, and they look like they're suspicious, or they're up to no good, you call these guys and let them know. They'll assess it further, and if they think it needs our intervention, we'll come out. Because once again, remember, you don't know what you prevent. So just by him walking out and looking into the parking lot or having a conversation or us coming out could stop a potential problem because he knows he's now been spotted. All right? It's all of our jobs. You see suspicious behavior, you report to security. If a door has been disabled, you let them know because they need to know about it so they can rectify that situation. The building's locked for a reason. You have to have passes to get in for a reason. So make sure you use all those, to all those tools. They're there for your safety. Sometimes are they inconvenient? Yeah, I understand that. They are sometimes. But they're here so nobody can get in and do bad things. So everybody's job to protect each other, okay? The other thing is you need to be looking out for one another in terms of a lot of these active shooter scenarios occur from inside the house. Employees who are disgruntled, upset, and we're going to talk about what you need to look for in somebody who could potentially be an active shooter. You need to report that behavior to security and human resources as quickly as you can so that they can mitigate that circumstance. When you're coming in the door to this building, do not let people piggyback on you unless you know who they are. If I know her and she's following me, and that's okay. I know she's an employee. I know she belongs. But some guy standing outside the door follows me in as I walk into the door, and I don't know who he is. That's a problem. If anybody is ever in your environment, you don't know who they are, and they don't have a badge, you need to challenge them. You look like you need some help. Let me call security and get you a badge. It doesn't have to be confront confrontational, but it needs to be, I see you, and you don't have a badge on, and I've never seen you before. So I'm going to walk up and say, do you need some help? Because I see you don't have a badge. Let me get you over to Carlos, and we're going to get you a badge. What I'm saying is, you don't belong, and we're going to figure out where you belong. There should be a series of different badges for the, for the place. If somebody shows up at Cox Media, and they are an unannounced guest, security should take their ID, write in the book themselves who they are. Don't let it write down themselves. You look at the ID, make sure it sort of matches this person, and then you write the information down, find out who they're here to see, and make that person come down to get them. You then issue them a badge, and the badges should be designed in such a way that if she has one badge, it means she has to have an escort. Another badge may mean she's been here before, she knows her way around, she doesn't need an escort. If there are guests that's on a roster, so we should know, oh, I'm here to see so-and-so, yes, I have an appointment. That's a rostered guest. We know they are coming. We're expecting them. 
We write them in the book, but we don't need to see ID because we know they're coming, but we still make somebody come down and get them. That's how we control our environment, and it's all of our jobs, not just your security staff. Everybody's responsible for this. Any, any suspicious behavior in or around the building, you report it as quickly as you can. To them, they report it to us, we deal with it. Control access as best you possibly can in and out of this building. Don't let people piggyback on you. Make sure they have their IDs, and you should be required to have them on with you all the time. Now, the city of Dayton city building has the same kind of a setup that you do. And they allow, they, they disable the alarm systems and the, and the locking mechanisms too. And we go in there and tell them, man, you can't be doing this kind of stuff. You know, this is a risky environment. You can't do that. I know it's inconvenient sometimes to have to have your little badge and pass, but you got to do it. You got to, to keep these folks out. You should have an escape plan with at least two escape routes. I know you have floor captains or environment captains or area captains. You should have at least two escort routes out of this building that you should know them and they should be practiced like a fire drill, okay? You should practice them at least once a year, if not more. And you need to be thinking in terms of this. In an active shooter drill, you want to get out of this building as fast as you can. So you need to figure out how you're going to do that and work together to come up with that plan. So practice it. You have established policy here at WHIO. It needs to be followed. It needs to be understood. And the management from each level needs to know that their employees understand the policy and follow it to the letter. Okay? If a manager knows somebody's not following the policy or the manager themselves is not following the policy, they're mitigating the security measures you put in place. That's a problem. And it puts you at risk not only from violence, but for also liability. As management personnel, your deportment is critical in a critical incident because your employees will follow your lead. If you know what to do and how to do it and remain calm, they will too. If you lose control and do not, do not know what to do, they don't know what to do. You are the leader. You've got to make sure that you are doing the right thing and you, are un you understand the plan better than they do and know how it's supposed to flow. There should be some system in the building that if an active shooter or some other violence occurs, everyone could be notified immediately. Whether it's an alarm system, we know, okay, this alarm means there's an active shooter, which means what? We get out. We have staging areas that we're going to go to. That all has to be part of the plan. The ID badges are critical. They need to be on you all the time. These are some of the indicators of potential violence in an employee. If you have a fellow employee who is, is displaying these kinds of behaviors, you need to report it to human resources and to security. And increase alcohol and drug usage, OK? Increase absenteeism that is unexplained. Unexplainable absenteeism and increase in that. Appearance or hygiene change going down, okay? If they, they're, they're, they're letting their appearance drop, their hygiene is dropping, these are signs that they're having some depression issues. Withdrawal and depressed. Resistance or overreaction to policy changes. You know, when the organization makes policy changes, a lot of times none of us like those, but we gotta live with them. If they're particularly resistive, they're particularly angry, they're very demonstrative about those, that needs to be reported. Particularly saying, you know what, I'm gonna do something about this. They're not telling you what. Increase violent mood swings that you cannot explain. Unstable emotional responses. They're explosive outbursts with no purpose for them, no reason behind why they're, why they're blowing up. Suicidal comments, putting their house in order, putting things in order, taking care of business, those kinds of comments. Paranoia, oh, they're all out to get me kind of a thing. All right, those are all bad signs. If they show empathy towards people who commit violent acts, a lot of these things tend to run in cycles. An active shooter will happen someplace else, and it will cause somebody else to do it too somewhere else. So if there's news coverage of something like this, and they're going, I can see how that could happen. I could see how somebody could do that. I understand how that guy feels. That's dangerous, OK? Increased talk about weapons or guns or dangerous tools that you did not ask them about, another bad sign. So you start to see clusters of these behaviors in people, you need to report it to human resources and to security. They should have a plan in place where they can be taken over to mental health care. They can be debriefed. There should be an assessment team in place that's made up of security, facilities, management on the scene, whoever manages this person directly, maybe even the unions involved. But there should be an assessment team to make a decision about this person's mental health and what we can do to help them before this becomes a problem. When an active shooting occurs and the call comes into the police, this is how you need to respond. When three or four officers show up, we will be coming into the building. We will not wait. 
They're not going to wait for command. They're not going to wait for SWAT. Three or four officers show up. We're going to create what we call a quad. They look something like this. This initial crew of officers' job is to get into this building and intervene the active shooter and stop him by whatever means they have to. As they enter the building, you are going to be running out. You need to listen to what they tell you to do. You need to have your hands visible and open so they know you are not carrying a weapon. We don't know who you are, and we don't know if you're involved. So as you are running by us, you could be armed and end up behind us. So you've got to have your hands visible. Don't make any quick movements. Do what we tell you to do. The officers could be in a very different set of uniforms, but they will be uniformed. They could be in SWAT gear, regular police gear, bike uniforms, but they will have some kind of a uniform on. They will have some representation of law enforcement. Their guns will be drawn, and they will be moving very quickly. They will be telling you what to do. Hands up, hands open, move slowly, do what they tell you to do. Do not resist. Do not ask them for help. Officer, I need you to do this. That's not their function at this point. Their job is to get in this building as fast as they can and find where he is and get him stopped. They may ask you questions when you call dispatch and you say, we've got somebody shooting in the building. Do not get frustrated with them, okay? Just because you are still talking to the dispatcher or the call evaluator does not mean we are not en route. We are already en route. But they are gathering intelligence for us so we can make wise decisions and know what's going on. Provide them with, if you know.